Welcome everyone. We're gonna get started in just a second. Welcome to today's session, everyone. We are PreMedCC, a student-led organization established in the fall of 2021. Our goal as an organization was to create an online program for pre-medical students at community colleges and universities with the hope of guiding the next generation of diverse and inclusive physicians. And while we advertise our organization as being for community college students, our events are open to anyone. We realize that finding guidance and mentorship in a pre-med journey can be especially challenging for first-generation pre-med students. People that lack the financial resources or just those who do not know people in the medical field. One of the best parts about our events is that they are virtual, so you can do it from the comfort of your own home. We typically have events on Fridays from 5 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and on Saturdays from 11 a.m. to 12.30 Pacific Standard Time. If you aren't able to attend the event, all of our sessions are uploaded on our YouTube channel. Many of our sessions will end up with a Q&A with the speaker. Any questions that you have, you may put it in the Q&A session on Zoom, and our team members will read them and have them answer. After you have attended our event, you can log on to our website and complete the quiz, which will contain questions pertaining to our session today. If you score 70% or higher on the quiz, you will be awarded a certificate to show that you attended our session today. If you want to stay connected with the upcoming events or just want to tell your pre-med friends about the pre-med CC, you can find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok as at pre-med CC. Well, welcome everyone. And um, we're gonna get, we're gonna let each person introduce themselves and we'll start with Jessica and, uh, and we'll go around. Hi everyone, my name is Jessica Susanto. Um, I'm from Southern California, specifically like OC LA area. I went to community college. I went to Fullerton College for two years before transferring here to Stanford this past fall. Here I'm studying history and minoring in human rights. Hi everyone, um, I'm Cassie. I am from Northern California, specifically Sonoma County. I went to Santa Rosa Junior College before transferring here. And at Stanford, I'm studying human biology. Anna? Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Anna Mattinger. I um, transferred here from De Anza College in Cupertino after going uh, virtually for two years, and I'm studying computer science. And then Cyrus. Hi, everyone. I'm originally from the Bay Area, uh, from a town called Centerfell. I went to school at Santa Rosa Junior College, and at Stanford, I'm studying biology with a focus in cell molecular and developmental biology. Hi everyone, I'm Camden. I'm a second year non-traditional transfer student from the College of Southern Idaho. Uh, on the campus now, I live with my three kids and wife and I study astrophysics and comparative literature. Very cool. So, um, so we're gonna get a question. The first question we're gonna get started from is why did you guys choose to apply to Stanford? Um, I can answer that one. I During community college, I did a internship with Stanford Medicine. They have a lot of really great internships for community college students. Um, the one that I did was the Stanford Summer Community College Program for pre-medical students. Um, and I learned a lot from that internship and just kind of fell in love with Stanford in general and Stanford Medicine. And so I thought, why not apply and see where it goes? What about you, um, Jessica? Yeah, I kind of applied to Stanford as um, it was just a long shot for me. I had actually applied to transfer twice before. So in total, I applied to college three times. I applied as a high school senior and then once as a first year transfer and then 
second year transfer. So um, I think it was just the collaborative environment. Um, we also have like a great history department here and a center of human rights with professors who specifically work on um, Southeast Asia issues, which is what I'm interested in. Um, I thought it would be a perfect fit because of the mentors that are here and um, they have a very direct correlation to what I wanna do in the future. Very good. Um, what about you, um, uh, Camden? Yeah, um, I actually ended up at Stanford, or choosing Stanford because uh, it was on a list that my advisor gave me. <laughs> and then ultimately, it was one of the few places that had a particle accelerator could play, potentially play with. Um, very cool. Um, what about you, Anna? Oh, uh, I did while I was in community college, I did a summer internship uh, called Acre. It was this new program where you could do uh, aero astro research at Stanford um, as a community college student. And that experience um, really drove home. I was already interested in Stanford, but that experience really drove home the just amount of support that's available for students here uh, and the amount of research opportunities. And so I, yeah, I just figured I'd shoot my shot, especially since I am a non-traditional student. I have kind of a weird uh, story and it seemed like that might resonate with Stanford more than some other universities. So yeah. Can you talk about a little bit about your story? Yeah, sure. So I- Because um, I, did, I did Google you, by the way. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I, uh, I only went to high school for about a year. I finished up at community college and there was, uh, had some other weird, uh, circumstances <laughs> during my adolescence. Um, and then I spent 10 years, uh, working and traveling, um, in, in very non-academic fields. I mostly worked, uh, within the arts and as a, a skilled laborer, uh, and just kind of dirtbagged around like moving cities every few days to few weeks for 10 years. <laughs> um, and it wasn't till lockdown hit and all my work got canceled and all my travel plans got canceled. Uh, and uh, I ran out of other things to do. And I was like, well, I guess it's a great time to go back to school. <laughs> so I think I was 29 when I enrolled virtually at community college uh, before, before ending up here. Um, and nothing I had done in my 20s really indicated that I was going to end up studying computer science, but it was something I'd been interested in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then um, Cyrus. Yeah, so um, I just have a huge interest in anything biomedical research um, oriented. And Stanford just had so many labs with cutting edge technology. And I felt like it was the best place for me to go. Um, also, the program that Cassie had mentioned, I had also attended. And Stanford's values really resonated with what I believe in, like the interdisciplinary aspect, things along those lines. Very cool. Um, and then, uh, and then, um, I think everybody went through it, right? Cassie, yes, I'm losing track of everyone. Um, so I put this thing in the chat uh, about a month ago. We had the dean of admission, um, and also the advising director gave a talk to us, and so we put that link in there. Um, uh, hopefully, after this, you could go watch that because a lot of the questions that are coming through um are answered and they will you know and so this is just most you know and so uh we'll try to get all your questions answered but i think a lot of the questions that you have is also um in that as well um uh wanted to ask um so uh you guys are all like have different majors and things um how was the transition from community college to stanford in terms of academic was it harder? Was it easier? Was it impossible? Did you regret it? Were you thinking any of that stuff? So um, I think we'll let Jessica go first. Yeah, that's really, that's a great question. I think, um, well, to give some context at community college, I was an econ and business major, and it wasn't until I got here to Stanford that I switched to history. So that kind of transition was partly 
like just doing a different field and learning how to write historical papers. Um, I think I definitely, there's definitely like a learning curve, at least for me. First quarter was a lot of trying to figure things out, trying to figure things like how um, professors like wanted certain papers, how I could balance my own schedule. Um, but that's like very, very common and normal here. I think it really helped that I had a lot of support from my department, um, from my other transfer peers here. I had like great mentors here. We also have a lot of um, tutoring on campus that's completely free. So we have the Hume Center. We also have like CTL tutors if you're more in the STEM field. So it's definitely not impossible. Um, and you have a lot of support here to help you. And once you get like over the first quarter, it becomes a lot easier. What about you, uh, Anna? Yeah, I would. So in some ways, I think it's been easier being a student here. And in some ways, I think it's been harder. Um, I definitely had a difficult adjustment my first two quarters. Uh, I think I started with my first quarter here with this class called CS107E, which is pretty full on. Um, but when I was in CC, especially doing it online, I think there was just a lot less in the way of support um, uh, for instructors and students. Uh, and that made it pretty hard because sometimes, you know, I'd, you'd be taking like, 19 STEM units just hold up in a room and have no one to really ask your questions to. Um, not everyone uh, that you took classes with was accessible. So here, once I got over some of the perfectionism that I had while I was in community college and just relaxed a little bit, I realized like there's, there really is a lot of support here. There is tons of office hours. There's tons of really helpful, like awesome people. Um, so I, I think once you get over the initial imposter syndrome, it's actually in, in many ways uh, easier to hear, even though I think the classes um, themselves uh, often hold you to a higher standard, but there's a lot more support to get you to meet that standard. Um, Cassie, I guess. Yeah, I think just echoing what everyone else said, um, there's a lot of resources here, and I think like coming into it, I definitely put a lot of pressure on myself to be perfect. And I think once I let go of that, I realized like I can thrive here because there's so much support in place um, for students. Like I'm a human biology major. There's constant office hours with our eight TAs that we have for our core classes. There's office hours with professors. Um, there's tutoring. There's a lot of really great um, resources. So I think the adjustment emotionally was harder than it was academically um but once you like realize that you belong here and you can thrive in this environment and you start making use of the resources i think like it's definitely manageable um i don't know cyrus or kevin whichever one wants to jump in i can go um, like everyone else had said, um, there's a lot of resources and support here. Uh, my biggest problem, not problem, I guess, but obstacle was uh, my first class uh, in chemistry here at Stanford. It was, um, I, I was, I felt very prepared from my uh, classes at community college, but it, um, it was just a huge transition of just changing the knowledge into the way they wanted me to understand things. But um, again, with all the support and resources, it was um, doable. Uh, with help, of course. And then Camden? Yeah, I, I think I would echo that last point that uh, Cyrus made in um, how they want you to understand things was definitely something new to me. I was, uh, you know, sitting in examinations and, and looking at how they wanted me to answer the question, and it was completely new. It's not computation or, you know, things that I got, had gotten used to at my community college. Um, but I think the biggest thing for me wasn't necessarily adjusting to the academics, uh, the rigor of the academics. It was adjusting to the uh, the timing of it. Somebody asked in the chat about the quarter schedule versus the semester schedule. And I think that was the biggest shift that was the hardest for me to kind of uh, get used to was switching from a semester to a quarter system. Very cool. Um, the other question is, um, 
So, Camden, you have a family and children, um, and you're probably older than some of your classmates. How is that transition with having a family at Stanford and, uh, you know, a partner and being able to go from student to dad to partner to student again? Yeah, that, it definitely adds uh, another layer on top of things. Um, the resources that they have here are uh, really great, but if you're also a parent, then odds are it's more difficult to take advantage of them the majority of the time. Um, but I think that they are accommodating enough and understanding enough of the situation that they do the best that they can to really uh, to really help you to achieve in the same way and same resources that everyone else has. That said, uh, there are significant, uh, I guess, challenges to the state of mind of of being an older student in the in the class. Um, you know, my oldest daughter is about the age of a freshman; she's just a few years shy. So, sitting in classes with students that are the age of my daughter, or with a professor that's a couple years younger than me. <laughs> That's a, it's a little odd and it's um, it's a little bit much to get over psychologically, but I think that when when you've managed to do that yourself, then uh, you're you're better for it. You have the experience and um, you can really bring that to the table in a way that perhaps a traditional student can't or doesn't often. Great. Um... And somebody asked uh, how old you are, and I'm not going to ask you that. So if you want to share that with them, um, <laughs> excuse me. Um, a lot of people were asking about um, how does that, um, uh, how does taking the classes um, that you took at community college transfer um, over? Um, actually, you know what. Cyrus, do you want to answer that? Um, how you're able to manage that being a student and a husband? And yeah, um, it, one thing that I did notice is it, it like, I guess, just limits the amount of uh, things I can do in terms of like social participation. Um, I'm still able to do it. It's just like I have to kind of balance everything between my wife, um, work, and school and friends. Um, but echoing what Camden had said. It is um, uh, it, an interesting obstacle when everyone, I'm 27 years old for reference. Um, and it, 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 um, it does feel a little odd like that my supervisors, my professors are all somewhat around my age or sometimes even younger. But um, like Candon had said, it, it's um, once you get past that, it can be, I don't know, like, a good learning experience like it, it's um you're able to thrive here as long as you can just get past that i feel but and anybody else wants to answer that question or all right so a lot of people are asking about uh classes that you took at community college and how do they transfer um since you know if you go to a uc if you want to transfer to uc there's transfer um articulation uh what about um what did you guys do to manage that and um again uh dean shaw and uh dr petty really talked about this at length so i would highly recommend you to watch that video but i want to ask you guys this personal experience uh, i can yeah um, no problem. yeah so uh i I basically followed the UC requirements since I also applied to UCs, but uh, what I found was, so when you get accepted as a transfer, you're awarded a number of units. And then when you choose your major, the department also evaluates whether you get credit. And I found that it seems pretty easy to get things like basic math or um, like chemistry, physics, that kind of stuff to transfer over since that's pretty standard taught in a pretty standard sequence just about everywhere. Um, as a CS major, it was a little more uh, ambiguous what I was going to get transfer credit for. I took a ton of CS classes before I got here. And then when I got here, I think I got award credit for three. 
uh, total CS classes. Um, so I got to skip some of the um, beginning classes, but everything else in the core I have to take, um, which is great because the CS instruction here is awesome. Um, I really like my classes, but I would say uh, getting kind of like the core requirements done on the program sheet, like if you're part of the School of Engineering or part of the, you know, um, whatever your department is, um, getting the sort of basic, more general um, stuff out of the way. Also, English and speaking classes, you can potentially petition to get out of these classes called Power One and Power Two, uh, which uh, is another thing I did, um, and that saves saves on stuff that you have to do here that you could easily do at community college. Yeah, my experience of uh, transferring things was fairly different, I think. Um, being able to submit your uh, syllabi from your community college and kind of argue your case is what I found that I had to do the most was collecting all the information from the professors at my CCs that I had uh, taken that I saw that were equivalent to courses. Um, they did transfer in, it's kind of similar to Anna, I had a, I had a lot. <laughs> had a lot of classes that I was trying to get evaluated, but even with those, I wasn't able to petition my way out of most of the standard classes, um, which can also be a little bit of a, a challenging thing, depending on your major. Uh, I transferred in the full amount of units that you can transfer in, but I still had to do all of the general requirements and none of the transferred in units actually went to my major. So being able to transfer in units isn't necessarily um, what's going to progress you the most to your major, depending on what you're focusing on or, or where you're headed. Anyone else? Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, when I found out I got into Stanford, I was really excited um, because they said that the units would be accepted. And I didn't realize this meant like the unit count, not like the classes I took. Um, so I think it's definitely worth it to do your research to determine like, are you gonna wanna spend your first year like redoing um, classes that you already did at your community college? And um, and is that worth it to you? Because it can be kind of jarring when you get here and it's like you're um, retaking classes that you've already taken and in these intro level classes, um, but you got like 90 units transferred over, for example, but you're still an in intro level. What were those classes? Um, I'm a human biology major. And so for me, it was like I had to retake the core, which is um, if you're a sophomore at Stanford, you are taking the core like your sophomore year. Um, so I took those classes at community college, like, for example, evolution. Um, yeah, stuff like that. So I just had to retake the whole hum bio core. And uh, I can brief. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I can briefly speak on like the humanities part. I think it really does depend on the department that you're in. So the way that transfer credit is applied, it's directly through your department, and you have to like make your case with the department chair or the, the undergraduate chair. Um, so for me, history was really quite easy. I think they were very flexible with me. Um, Again, I only took like very, I took very few history classes and a lot of my other classes that were like more um, CSRE or um, ethnic studies or Asian American studies, um, they applied towards my history credit. So it is like kind of a department and case by case basis, but I would echo the uh, same thing that Camden said that it's really important to just collect the information. So if you have any papers or assignments from your classes and collect the syllabi, um, your syllabus from each of those classes. That would be, save you a lot of time when, once you get here. Yeah, I posted a Stanford transfer credit database. They have a database that basically for the students that have transferred into Stanford, they, they created this database that I put on there. Um, not all schools are posted. And so you just have to go look through there and they have that posted on their student services website. Um, so uh, I'm just sorry. about that link, sorry. Um, it's like that link is showing what units were accepted for transferring for like the 90 towards graduation. It doesn't actually mean that those classes are accepted to weigh you out of anything. Okay. Yeah, it's really important. I feel 
to understand that it's really just by department. Like it's whether the department chooses whether or not to um, establish equivalencies between your community college classes and Stanford's classes. Right, and and I think uh, Camden was right about keeping your um, syllabi, and that was the same thing that was said by uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Petty and Dean Shaw. Um, so, uh, yeah, hang on to your syllabi. Yes, yeah, so syllabi. Yes, more than one syllabus. Um, uh, anybody else wants to add to this? I would uh, I would add that uh, if your courses aren't necessarily taken towards your major, that's not necessarily a, a bad thing, right? Because uh, for my own case, the only reason that I'm also a comp lit major is because the comp lit department, kind of uh, what Jessica said, the comp lit department took my transfer stuff, but my physics department didn't. So I'm able to double major because uh, with, with the caveat of the financial aid aspect of double majoring there is uh, that you do need to look into if you're considering that but uh, they took my my transfer stuff for the comp lit major so I was basically done with my comparative literature degree even though I'm just barely starting on my physics degree so the transfer to units not being taken by the phys physics department didn't necessarily slow down my progress towards physics it just gave me a leg up for something else excellent anyone else wants to add to this um, I just wanted to make a note about that document that I had shared with you, Jovan. Um, that, that is the exact document that I submitted to my department in order to get equivalencies and they approved everything. But um, I try to lay out like all the course descriptions and syllabi just in the most organized possible way and would just recommend doing that if the situation arises. Yeah, and people keep on asking about what was you guys' GPAs and stuff. And so I'll put this out there. Dean Shaw said that they've accepted students that had 3.2 all the way to 4.0. So, um, so every student here is in that range. And uh, I just think that asking people what's their numbers, I think, you know, may make them uncomfortable. So, uh, so again, watch the talk by Dean Shaw and, and he basically uh, talks about this. So the range is 3.2 to 4.0. So, um, so I just kind of want to throw out there because that question keeps on coming up and we just want to put it out there now. Um, uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. So I also want to, um, some people is asking about like the application. So I don't know if you guys want to talk like about the application process. How was it? What do you think what, um, stand up in your application? I can go first. I, um, as I mentioned, went through the transfer application twice. Um, and the first year I did not um, apply to Stanford, but I was quite unsuccessful. And um, between like learning from the first time and the second time, um, I didn't get any smarter. I think I just learned how to like package my application a little bit better. So I think the number one tip that I would give everyone is I think it's really important to hone in on like a theme or something that you're really interested in. Um, for me personally, like I was really interested in um, women's advocacy and homeless advocacy in my lo local community. And that was kind of the theme of my application. Um, so there was like a connect, like a connective theme throughout all of my extracurriculars and seen through my essays as well. Um, I also think having great letters of recs were really important. I saw in the questions that some people asked, like what made you stand out? And in the fall, I took a look at my FERPA document to see my comments from my application. And um, for me personally, it was my letters of recommendations that really uh, made me stand out, I think. But I think it's a collective narrative. They look at everything. They don't just look at your GPA or certain extracurriculars. I think they really care that you uh, care about something. Uh, it doesn't really matter what. <laughs> just care about something really passionately. And I think it always helps to have strong advocates for you. Yeah, just echoing what Jessica said, um, I also read my file and what they talked about was that like what I wrote about in my essays, I was very passionate about and they could tell that I was passionate about it through my essays. And um, 
what I would say to people is it's better to write an essay about something that might be like quote unquote less impressive, but that you truly care about and are truly passionate about than trying to write about your like more impressive things that you've done, but that you don't necessarily um, have passion about because you can always put those more impressive things on like the extracurricular section of your application um, so that your essay is just really showing like, this is what I care about, this is who I am, and this is why I think like I excel in Stanford. Like, Anyone else? Um, one thing I did want to say was, um, like Jessica, I also reviewed my application after I was accepted. And um, I did want to link here, I'll send it to Yovan. Um, there was a few things that they really honed in on with my application. Um, they called it, they had like a short form, like A-E-I-V-E-A. They stand for academic excellence, intellectual vitality, and extracurricular activities. So those are like three things they really hone in on. But um, when they were ranking my uh, uh, extracurriculars, one of the first things they put was my Stanford Community College program. Then they put my um, medical volunteering. Then they put my research experience. Not sure if that's helpful, but that's the order they ranked it in. Yeah, similar uh, to the, to the uh, what's been said, I reviewed my application as well, and I noted those same uh, those same metrics. And uh, there was a question asked in the chat about extracurriculars. To that end, I didn't have any. Uh, I was going to school part time with you know, while I had my kids, and I was working full time. Um, so extracurriculars were impossible. And they specifically noted that on my on my application, uh, no app, no extracurriculars. However, in my essay, I spoke about that. I spoke about the, the fact that I can't do extracurriculars. It's not something that I could do. But I didn't. I didn't talk about that in a way that was uh, apologetic. Um, and I think that that's an important part of your essay is, is being completely honest and taking the the unvarnished aspects of real life and and plugging that in as a as a CC transfer. You you have a good story to tell, surely. <laughs> and not not being ashamed of the the w's on your transcript or something like that is a big deal because those are all moments of, of learning and discovery you know what did you learn from that w how did that shift how you thought about taking classes or what struggles did you have to deal with to, to overcome that w those are all important parts of who you are right now and who you'll be when you make your applications so that part of my application was specifically discussed um, by the reviewers of, well, he has kids, obviously he's not doing a bunch of extracurriculars. He has a job, obviously he's doing this. So um, as was said, it's it's a really a much more holistic process. Your, your boxes you check are far, far secondary to how you can um, present your story, who you are. Thank you. Um, do you wanna share on something, Anna? Oh, sure. I figured I'd, I'd piggyback off that. I think um, like talking to prospective transfers and looking at when I was a prospective transfer last year, I think there's a lot of pressure on transfer applicants to kind of like be perfect and tick all the boxes. And I think one thing to keep in mind is that like, you know, like those those kinds of kids are a dime a dozen at Stanford, like in terms of the freshman class, like you've got a lot of smart kids who look really good on paper, have all the ECs, have the high GPA. But the transfer community it, here is small and pretty diverse. And I think they're really looking for kind of like an interesting story, an interesting journey. There's, you know, a lot of transfers here who uh, talked about like highlighted mistakes that they've made in their lives, like including pretty significant ones or other things that happened to them or that they did. And I don't think they're necessarily looking for just another perfect model student on paper because they have a lot of those already. <laughs> um, I think with the transfers, they, they're they really looking for like who you are and what you'll add to that soup of um, perfect high achieving young students. Um, yeah, go um, ahead. Um, anybody just, else? Oh, sorry. I was just gonna ask if do you all um, got some help on your personal statement and how, like, how was that? I can go first. I personally didn't. Um, I just 
mainly did it by myself and I had my best friend kind of look it over for um, some grammatical errors or when I needed help uh, getting rid of words for the word count. And that was basically it. That was also because I procrastinated on my application. So I think I would have asked for more help um, or send it to my counselor or those that were close to me had I had a little more time. Similar to Jessica, I didn't I didn't have anyone really looking over any of my stuff. Um, I did have an advisor uh, look at my my very first draft of my essay, but um, after that first draft, I felt like I was um, sharing myself in a way that I didn't want to I didn't want to have a whole bunch of eyes on. Uh, so I kind of just accepted that this would be going to um, people that wouldn't uh, necessarily judge me for it in a personal way um which is kind of ironic because they are in fact you know judging your your application for admittance but um with that i felt like i could be more honest and and share more um, just by not having people look at it uh, that may have been a mistake in retrospect maybe i could have improved my application but uh the fact that i'm here suggests it doesn't really matter either way for me personally yeah, I completely agree with Camden. I also didn't have anyone look at my application. And the reason was, was because I was so personal um, and honest. And I didn't, I felt like I could convey who I was more without having to like worry about people who I knew reading it. Um, and so I think like something important in the applications I've talked to a lot of transfers is like, they really just kind of laid it all out there, you know, like who they were, what they've been through, why they are the person they are today. And sometimes it's hard to write those really powerful essays about like who you are as a person down to your core when you know like your college counselors are going to be reading it. Um, so I think there's definitely like pros and cons to having college counselors read it and having them not read it. And that's just something that um, you can consider on like an individual case by case basis. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, They're all you. Okay, um, so I I didn't have anyone look at my essays in an official capacity, but one thing that I thought would be a good idea, so one thing I did was I had some people I didn't know who, uh, like friends of friends, read my essays because I wanted to make sure that they made sense to someone who didn't know me. Like if I were to show my essays to someone close to me, they'd be able to follow the threads, but... Um, I think in my case, because I've had a really weird and disjointed life without a lot of continuity to it, it felt important to make sure that my essay would be comprehensible to a stranger. Um, but yeah, so I just had friends like recommend friends of theirs who were good editors and sent it to a couple of them. Yeah, and I think uh, Dean Shaw said one of the biggest things that drives them crazy is submitting essays with grammatical and spelling errors. So if uh, if you don't have it edited, just FYI. Um, any anybody else want to add to this? Yeah, um, I I just wanted to say so. I also had a really personal essays, but just who I am. I'm an, I'm an open I'm an open book. I don't really mind sharing my stories. Um, so I sent it to my mentors, my friends, basically anyone, just to get feedback. Um, I didn't really mind who had seen it or who would read it. Um, and, you know, it it, it kind of helped me at least uh, just narrow things down because I was over the word count in all of my essays. And I just wanted to know what would be the most um, efficient way to kind of trim things down while retaining the power of my stories. Um, and somebody asked in the chat um, about what the acceptance rate, uh, this is actually twice I was asked, um it's very competitive and again that was shared by dean shaw but i could share this one data is that 100 percent of people that don't apply don't get in so if you don't apply if you don't take your shot you're you're not going to get in so uh, it's a risk you have to put yourself out there and um but again you know um you know you have to try um this is a question that I was going to ask 
Oh, can Anna, I just add for uh, um, applying, if people's concerns for applying are financial concerns, because I know most colleges like Stanford are like $120 per application. Um, that was one reason why I didn't originally want to apply. Stanford is really good about giving you fee waivers for your application. And so there's like a million different criteria you can meet um, to get a fee wa waiver. And there's like also an other. So if you don't meet any of those, you can just write them in letter and be like, please, like I need help. <laughs> Um, so I was able to get it waived pretty easily. Yeah, a lot of CCs also have programs that'll cover um, application fees. Uh, mine was a very, very small college in a very, very small town, and they had programs to um, cover the cost of applications. I just had to find them. Yeah, if you if you are an EOPS student, they'll pay for your application to a certain number, but also. Um, a lot of the schools, I know Stanford, if you get a letter from your financial aid office, uh, you could get all, you know, most of the schools, if you have that, that you could get that waived as well. So that shouldn't be the challenge. And uh, talking about the bling, um, can you guys uh, talk a little bit about the financial aid? Because what is it, the sticker price? I think it's $70,000. Um, I, I know Cyrus personally, and so I know that he's not paying $70,000, but anybody else? wants to talk about financial aid and financial support. Yeah, um, I found that Stanford had the best financial aid offer out of any of the colleges I applied to. Um, because they are a private institution, they have a lot of scholarships and they're very, very generous with those scholarships. Um, I think, I don't know the exact numbers, but I know if your family makes like something close to like 120, under 120,000 per year, then I think all room to it, room and board and tuition are covered. Is that correct? It's like, there's some baseline number um, that's close to that. And so if your family makes under that, you're basically getting everything covered. Um, Stanford's financial aid website also has like a financial aid calculator where you can put your family's financial information. Um, it's like anonymous, like there's no, they don't save your data or anything. And it will pretty quickly like shoot out how much um, you'll get in financial aid, but they're very, very generous. Yeah, I can also add to this, like the cost of college was a big concern for me, just because um, I'm fly and I didn't want to burden my parents. Um, for me, I was really lucky. I like um, Stanford is very generous, was the most generous offer that I got from, you know, all of my all of the colleges that I applied to, including like Cal State Fullerton, Cal State, like Cal State's <laughs> UCs and um other schools. So they're very, very generous. Um, even I'm also like a Jack Kent Cook scholar. So I was very lucky to have that kind of financial support. So they covered everything. But even if I didn't have the scholarship, um, they Stanford would have paid for everything. Um, I also highly recommend if you guys are thinking of applying to transfer next year uh, to apply for the Jack Kent Cook scholarship. Um, I'm very biased, but it's the best thing that ever happened to me. I'm able to like afford um, certain things with the scholarship and you have such a great network of uh, other scholars from different schools. Um, and I think the application is out next January. So I highly recommend if you're still at CC to look into that. Yeah, we had a session with two Jack Jackson scholars and I know that in the fall, we're gonna have another session. So um, definitely look into it. Um, this is a question. <clears throat> oh, sorry, Anna. Oh, sorry. I was going to add, because uh, I, I, I don't think this was mentioned. Another thing is for anyone who doesn't know, if you're over, I think, 25, um, you're considered an independent by default, I think. Uh, and so, you know, only your assets are taken into consideration in need-based financial aid uh, calculations, um, since the assumption is you're on your own at that point. Um, and that kind of simplifies things. Like, I didn't have to fill out... Uh, you know, as much stuff. Cause I was basically like, yeah, I, I freelance and I don't own anything. So, <laughs> um, and another thing consideration is if you would be coming here with a family or with a partner that can change some things. Um, my housing is almost completely covered, but because I'm living here with a partner, uh, like, you know, there's like an expected contribution for his part of the rent. Um, so, and that wasn't something that was immediately clear when I first showed up because there was no itemized uh, 
there's no atomization. So I wasn't actually sure how much aid I was getting or not getting um, until I'd been here for a while. But uh, but that being said, the TLDR is the aid here is really good. Camden, I'm sorry, do you guys want to add to this? Yeah, I think uh, along a similar vein, uh, the if you're coming here with a family uh, and this is home now, um, definitely something to consider is uh, how you're covering your housing for the summer because the financial aid actually only covers your quarters while you're studying, it doesn't cover the summer. So um, you, you will have potentially the full rent to cover while you're here living on campus with your family over the summer. Yeah, I think honestly everything has been covered. Um, but uh, like Camden said, that is something that uh, snuck up on me and I'm getting ready to pay rent for this summer as well. But I did not know that when I first applied. I will say um, if you're applying this application cycle, definitely get on the financial aid application sooner rather than later because they have three different applications to apply for financial aid. And that can take um, quite a bit of time, especially because between applications, there's like a verification process and it can take a couple of weeks. Um, so if you know you're, you want to apply to Stanford, start early. Oh, um, I did want to say if you end up getting in and you didn't submit your financial aid, it's never too late. Just contact them. They will work with you. Yeah, we're getting a couple of questions about med school and, uh, and we had the Dean of Admissions from Stanford give a talk, so go check those out. These folks, they're not in med school. Um, the other thing is that um, this is mo mainly for Anna, Hamlin, and Cyrus is you guys are older, so did you guys talk about before you started your educational journey and how was that important part of your application? Uh, because your life didn't start the first day you went to school. So can you guys talk a little bit about that and how you incorporated your life experiences into your application? Yeah, that was like the, my whole application was just um, leaning really hard into just having been this kind of weird gallivanting dirtbag. <laughs> and because uh, I didn't really have a lot of the the sort of track record. I did have good grades when I went back to CC and did online classes because I just didn't do anything else um, during those two years. Basically, I was just doing distance learning during lockdown, didn't have any um, ECs or anything, but was just obsessed with school. <laughs> um, but other than that, like I when I went to community college the first time, I think I was 16 or 17 and I was just doing it to get my high school diploma because I hated high school. Um, and I ended up dropping I think I had signed up for seven classes it was like 23 units or something uh all stem classes in one quarter and I burned out and I dropped all of them just got w's and ran off to the woods for six months and built trails on the PCT <laughs> um and I was gonna originally go back to college after that and instead I was like yeah or maybe not like college college is for chumps whatever and I just like started working uh and and traveling around and a lot of what I was doing was, uh, you know, like hitchhiking and dumpster diving and just kind of finding random gigs. And over time, that led to more opportunities to do more skilled and specialized work. And um, I don't know, have a more uh, comfortable time of it. But it was very, you know, um, but that was that was sort of the thing is, is like you just you are who you are, you know, and you've your life is what it is. And everybody has a way that they can kind of like leverage their own unique experience of the world uh, to bring something different to the table. Because um, most of the transfers, I don't think fit the mold. Uh, I think I said this already of like that kind of perfect on paper, you know, did everything right in high school student. Um, and that that's sort of what they're looking for. So anyway, I forgot what, oh yeah. Uh, I was trying to remember what the original question was. I'm I'm old and that I think can be <laughs> can actually be very much to your advantage because you have you've had a whole you've had a lot of time to kind of arc out your journey, you know, so <laughs> um, which makes essay writing a little easier. <laughs> yeah, so um, like, I guess for me before um, community college, I 
in in high school like freshman year my dad had a stroke and ended up getting dementia afterwards uh so i took care of him throughout high school and uh i had to stay home instead of going to school because of uh different circumstances but i ended up graduating with um a 2.6 gpa i think uh right after that my dad passed away and so i was really depressed after that and for about 3 or 4 years i kind of just spent the time finding myself traveling across the pacific northwest was homeless at a point um but it it just i guess like at, at a point during all that i started making money and i saw that my life wasn't really going in the direction that i wanted so i ended up going back to community college um and i really just kind of i guess like academia never seemed like a place for me like my family my friends no one had gone to college um but i just i guess found a love for learning like i it, it sounds kind of cheesy but like i just really it, everything that i learned just continued to pique my curiosity and i kind of wanted to learn more and more and um i feel like being able to talk about my journey um from i guess you know down low to getting to here it was it really stood out in my essays yeah i think that's i think sarah's makes a lot of important points about that and that 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 uh discovery that you can you can have as a as an older student is really something unique um for myself i i didn't finish high school i dropped out as soon as i could and went straight to the career field that was in construction for 15 years <laughs> and then thought you know what maybe uh, maybe learning isn't as bad as i thought it was so um ged before going back to community college but yeah i think that's an important part of your story and what makes you unique kind of like um as anna mentioned it's really it it helps you redefine the mold if not completely break it it's it's something that i think is to be proud of that is uh is definitely something to let through in in your applications and your essays let people see exactly the struggles and and the challenges and why you're applying uh, above wanting to have a nice climate um so we have one question here um so like in your first days at the Stanford did you guys um, ever experience imposter syndrome absolutely it's impossible not to. I I don't think any like that's the biggest thing to remember each time you feel like you don't belong here is that everyone else is just thinking the exact same thing. So like you're all shared, you're all unified, and no one should be here. <laughs> But it's hard to it's definitely hard to accept. There's actually some really good literature out there about uh, I think they call it duck syndrome here. Um, but it's about imposter syndrome, and it's, it's completely common. And I, I would be surprised to hear anybody that didn't experience that and everyone i've talked to so far has or does and it doesn't just go away after like your first quarter or your first year like i've been here two years and i'm still sometimes it hits hits me and i'm like whoa you know um so it's important just to find community especially with your fellow transfers um but also just like maybe cultural groups that you identify with um people who are in the same pre-professional program that you are in like just find your community and like don't be afraid to have those conversations because that's when like you realize that everybody's going through this and it's like through talking about it and supporting each other that like you feel better so we've done yeah. a bunch of we've done a bunch of stuff on uh imposter syndrome and i could tell you that uh we have surgeons and physicians that struggle with this today so um it's something that you're gonna a, a lot of people deal with and you're not the only one and the people that don't talk about it are the ones who usually struggle with it the most but i think if you're open about it and seek community uh, i think that's the the best thing that could be said and this is something that like i said we have surgeons that struggle with this so if they do you know um But sorry. What about you, Jessica and Cyrus and Anna dealing with imposter syndrome? Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, um, I think I the summer before coming to Stanford, I had talked to a lot of transfers and they kind of told me the same thing. You know, you're going to experience imposter syndrome. 
just don't worry. It's completely normal. And I was a little naive and I was like, oh, I deserve to be here. I like, I don't think that'll be me. <laughs> and um, the first quarter that I got here, it was so bad. Like it just like hit me like a brick, like a ton of bricks. Um, and it does get better, definitely, but it comes out in different forms. Um, and I thought I had like been done with imposter syndrome like my first quarter I was like I deserve to be here like everything's good and then it just comes out in latent forms like in other quarters so for example winter quarter I like burnt myself out and I realized that that was because I just felt like a deep sense of um like if I didn't put 110 percent in what I was doing then I didn't deserve to be there. Um, and that's like another form of imposter syndrome. And then this quarter I'm struggling with, um, I think sometimes we can have like duck syndrome about duck syndrome, if that makes sense. So for instance, if like someone that you really respect has duck syndrome, um, then you get like duck syndrome because of of that because they're like oh if they're amazing then I then I must have you know feel more inadequate too I think it's just a constant like thing it comes and goes there's definitely a lot of support here though um the transfer community is great um Camden was my transfer 101 mentor um in the fall and what's great about Stanford is that there is a lot of support for you and we have a transfer 101 class um, in the fall that helps with that transition and also provides a space for you to talk openly about imposter syndrome, duck syndrome, anything that you're struggling with. So again, it's something that just follows you, um, but you have a lot of support here and people who have experienced the same things that you have. And if you talk to your professors too, they're like more than happy to talk about this. Yeah. yeah. Also, oh. um, with uh with imposter so I definitely felt that when I first got here and I think it made my time a lot harder than it had to be um there was actually a moment in fall quarter where I was just absolutely giving myself a really hard time um freaking out about CS 107e and my entire teaching team I think like my my instructor and like three of the CAs like all separately came up to me and were like you can relax like it's fine <laughs> like you're doing fine in this lab um I was really spinning out. And uh, the thing that really helped me personally is like find, find like clubs or things. Uh, that was really what made all the difference for me in the winter. Um, I've never really been like a clubs person before, but I'm pretty involved now with the Muay Thai club here, which was started by transfer students. And there's a lot of transfers who are part of it um, and grad students. So it's, it's kind of an older crowd, which for me is nice because, uh, I am more than 10 years older than most of my classmates in my C CS classes. Um, but like, just find a pocket like that, like, you know, um, some club, some group, uh, where you have some structured reason to meet people and hang out. Cause it can otherwise feel, I think, pretty overwhelming and difficult to make friends at first because everyone's busy and this place is big. Um, but that, after doing that, I feel like uh, my time here completely transformed and I've been having a really good time this quarter. Can you tell them what CAs are? Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, they're they're like TAs, basically. I actually don't know the difference. I think one of them is grad students and one of them is undergrads, but like uh, people have told me different, different they're basically TAs, so. <laughs> yeah, I have a... Uh... I know one of the deans at the medical school, and he is a first gen student himself. And he says he still deals with imposter syndrome, even though now he's a dean and he still struggles with it. So, um, what about you? Uh, anybody else wants to add to the imposter syndrome talk? Um, I guess I just want to say I, I kind of resonated with what everyone else had said. Um, I feel like everything had really been covered. Uh, wanted to reinforce that advice of just finding a pocket or people or some kind of community because it really helps. Um, I never felt like I would deal with imposter syndrome. I've been hearing about it for the past like three to four years. But once I got here, it like just gets, it hit me like a brick. I just did not uh, expect it at all. But meeting friends, meeting people in your classes, clubs, et cetera, th those all really help. Um, another question is, um, how much does a Stanford weight standardized test like SAT uh, 
Did it I went test optional. Yeah, so um, according to Dean Shaw, that Stanford is test optional for the foreseeable future. So. Yeah, I didn't submit any test scores or high school transcripts. I, I don't think I could have submitted a high school transcript anyway. Um, but yeah, it was just my CC transcript. I didn't submit any test scores or anything like that. Yeah, I also didn't submit any test scores. I didn't even take um, the test because my community college didn't require it. And then Stanford was test optional, so. I also did not, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I also did not submit my test score. I did take the ACT in high school, um, but I chose not to submit my score because I didn't feel like it was a strong, um, like strong view of my academic, so like per performance in community college. And I thought my transcript was um, a lot, a better indicator of my academic performance. Yeah, I had taken the SAT and ACT in high school, but that was like, 15 years ago or so um and I tried to get my old scores because I I couldn't remember what they were but I thought I remembered them being pretty good and I tried to dig up my old scores and basically got told that they were in a physical vault somewhere and I was going to have to put in a special request because they were such old results uh so I just didn't submit them um and I did submit my high school transcripts which were not good but uh I don't think they took them into consideration because it had been long enough Also, to quickly add on that, um, I know a lot of students are concerned about like their high school transcript. Like I did not do very well in high school. And they specifically know like in your application, like, oh, if you've done well in community college, they place more emphasis on that more or your most recent academic history than your performance, like anywhere from, you know, two to 10 years ago. Yeah, with that, um, if if you don't have your high school transcripts or if you don't want to submit them because you know that they, in, in my case, are partially abysmal and partially non-existent for the latter half, then really that's a, it's an opportunity to discuss that change, right? Because um, I think Anna had mentioned she did much better in uh, college uh, or somebody did. And that was uh, similar for, for me, uh, not wanting to do, have anything to do with school in, in high school. Um, I think my GPA at the lowest point was like a 0.5 or something like that, which is like difficult to achieve, really. It not, not, should be impressive. But um, so that transition is something I was able to talk about is, you know, not not wanting to have anything to do with school, doing absolutely abysmal all through high school or while I was there. And um, the drastic shift that I found when I was in college and, and how much different I found learning to be at the time. And Camden, somebody wants to ask if you were able to bring your spouse and your um, children with you to Stanford and you didn't leave them at home in Idaho, right? Yeah, they're they're with me here. Uh, we all live in uh, graduate housing. They have family housing for graduate students uh, as well as uh, spouse housing, partner housing. Um, so yeah, we're in a courtyard where my kids have lots of uh, friends to play with. And it's, yeah, it's very much set up for um, bringing your bringing your family if if you need to, and they have schools there, right? Yeah, my my kids' school um, is uh, a three minute walk away for the elementary school, and uh, my daughter that's in high school, her high school, the nearest high school is a mile away, and the next one's two miles away. So it's not she rides her bike to school every day, and uh, yeah, it's, it's not an issue at all. And and she goes to one of the best high schools in the country too. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, definitely a benefit of bringing your family with you as opposed to, I know a couple of transfers that um, they uh, they came here on their own and left their left their family, then they go back and visit it um, every weekend. Um, but coming here, my my kids have far better opportunities than where we were. Um, the schools are, are fantastic and um, I don't think they would have it any other way and I don't think I would either. Um, and on the top of topic of housing, can you guys all talk about housing? Um, certainly, some people that are housing insecure that brings anxiety, and so talk talk a little bit about that. Yeah, um, Stanford has guaranteed housing for every single student on campus, whether this is undergrad, um, 
grad, like master's student, they have a lot of housing. And I would say like probably 99.99% of um, students at Stanford live on campus. I think you have to do like a special waiver to live off campus because they really want to like foster that community where everyone lives um, on the same campus. And in terms of like the housing insecure factor to it, Stanford is really good about their financial aid. And if you are someone who needs financial aid for housing, like that will be covered. They're very, very generous with um, financial aid and housing. And there's also a lot of different housing types. So there's dorms, there's apartments, there's family housing um, where there's like playgrounds in the courtyard and stuff like that. So there's like a huge variety for what each student needs depending on what um, part of their life they're in. On that, there's also uh, off-campus housing and there are uh, situations where you can get uh, stipends for your rent if you're not in Stanford owned uh, apartments. I don't know how that works because I'm on campus, but um, I do remember that being a specific option that um, the housing the housing group was talking to me about when I was first looking at it. Uh, I think I, I mentioned that, that the summer was the biggest concern for me personally, but even that even that being uh, taken into consideration, there are so many opportunities to do research and stuff over the summer through the university, um, and the stipends are enough to cover the family housing. So really, um, I'm doing, I do research every summer or um, uh, otherwise doing internships will cover my summer housing. So it's not like I have to specifically get a job over the summer or something. I'm doing intern work or um, research work that is through Stanford still. Yeah, um, I just wanted to add on, I believe it's age of 25. After 25, you're able to go into graduate housing and they have it separated to like, like single graduate housing, couples without children and family housing, which is where Camden is part of. Um, I don't know if that's super applicable to the person asking the question. Oh, yeah. Also, oh, sorry, go ahead, Anna. <laughs> um, I think, yeah, I think if you're over 25, I think you you aren't allowed to live in the dorms, if I'm not mistaken, which is, is honestly great. Um, I'm, I'm in the couples without children housing. It's pretty nice. We have uh, like a one bedroom apartment with a balcony. So it, it feels like, you know, like living like a grown up um, and it's right on campus. Uh, and I think, like I mentioned before, it's not completely covered because I have my partner here. But if I were to choose to live in a uh, a single, I think that would all be covered. Um, I might be in a different living situation next year because my partner is actually transferring this year. And so it kind of depends on whether he gets into Stanford or not. So, but um, yeah, uh, lots of good housing options. Um, I quickly just wanted to mention if you're under 25, um, all transfers live in Kimball Hall, which is an upper class dorm, but it's also really nice because you get to know all of the transfers under 25 here. So you build like your own sort of little community. What about the application? Um, is it hard to get in to, into housing um, just to get accepted? It's guaranteed, but, um, and I'm not sure if it applies as transfers, uh, Cassie, you might know, but there's a lottery for housing. And so I just kind of submitted my preferences and then I got an email saying I got this housing, um, but I'm not sure how it works with under 25. Yeah, for under 25, it's not a lottery. Um, it's by class year. So they give, there's like gate times. And so if you're an upperclassman, like a senior, then you have priority to pick your housing first and then juniors and then sophomores and then um, freshmen. But there will always be like a guaranteed spot for you. Um, yeah. Um, we have another question. Is anyone working while studying and how do you keep the balance between school and work? Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Cyrus. No, no, no. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, so I, I, time management, just like planning Google Calendar is my best friend. Um, I do research. I also work on the side while going to school. Those two are separate. Um, it, it, it's just 
time management if um it, it can be hard because it's kind of like juggling multiple different things but if you can just set aside time for homework and it, it helped me to set time for sleep specifically um it, it makes it a lot easier to kind of manage um when i didn't do that it was very chaotic but when i have everything kind of in front of me on a calendar it really helps a lot Yeah, I also um, work as a student and echo everything that Cyrus said. Um, I will say, I think one of my major regrets at Stanford is trying to fit everything in within two years um, because there's so many incredible opportunities at Stanford. Um, I think like if you decide to transfer here, like don't rush yourself for two years, give yourself that extra third year because like the magnificent thing about Stanford is all of the incredible opportunities they have, whether that's studying abroad or um, like doing internships that are only available to Stanford students or being part of like world-class research. Um, you want to be a part of those things. And I think what I regret is um, trying to do everything in two years and working. So being very busy all the time where I can't really take advantage of the like, amazing opportunities here. So if you do know you're working, um, then like try to take that third year if you can. They always, I think always approve the third year for financial aid, um, at least from what I've heard. And so like, it doesn't hurt to take that third year just to give yourself extra time so that, you know, if you're busy with school and you're working a job, like you're still gonna have time to take advantage of the awesome resources or um, awesome opportunities here. On that note, it may also not necessarily be um, applying for a third or fourth year out of uh, comfort, but out of necessity. So definitely something to keep in mind. Um, I, I know for my program, I was allowed two years, but um, starting as a freshman, that's it's just not it's not possible. So um, you will be, if that's a kind of circumstance that you end up in as a transfer student, then you already know that you will be applying for a third year and a, probably a fourth year. I know a couple of students, I think it's a fifth year. Um, but as uh, Cassie mentioned, they are very, very uh, accommodating and understanding of the situation. And uh, it's kind of, as I understand it, kind of a crack in the process that they're well aware of. So they, they definitely take it upon themselves to do what they need to do to take care of you. Uh, we have another question. Is it hard to apply to study abroad uh, programs? I don't think so. There's like lots of different programs here. We have a great study abroad program. It's called BOSP and I can find the link and put it in the chat. Um, but we have lots of different study abroad programs. So we have quarter ones throughout the school year and we also have short-term summer terms um, which are about like anywhere from a week to three weeks long um, and we have lots of different places so you can go to Europe you can go to Asia you can go to Africa um, so lots of different opportunities and what's really interesting is that some other schools transfers may not be able to do study abroad because of like limited time but here um they make it known that you can totally study abroad while finishing your degree. Yeah, and those short-term summer programs are so incredible. Like the BOSP three-week trips, you can go to like the Galapagos, which is like insane that you can study there as a Stanford student. And like you you are on the National Geographic like um, yacht thing for this, like for those few weeks. And so it's just like things like that at Stanford that like you don't wanna miss out on um, like, so if you can take the third year, definitely do it. Anyone else want to add something? Okay, uh, we have another question. Um, some, when a student asks, I wanted to ask, what is the biggest piece of advice you will give to a community college student to stay focused and mod motivated through the entire tra transfer journey? I, I think I would say, as long as you're studying what you're interested in, 
then you'll you'll always be headed in the right direction. I'll say, and this this might be a bit of a doubter, but I, I think it's important to keep in mind that your admission into or rejection from any school is not a metric of your value. Like I got into Stanford, but I got rejected from like UC Santa Barbara and a bunch of other places. I think at the end of the day, it's it's kind of a crapshoot and it comes down partly to luck because um, we never really know. Uh, I don't know if that's that's not particularly helpful advice. So I'd say other than that, find find your people like that you're doing community college with, like make sure that you put yourself out there and have people to study with and people who are on the same trajectory and you can kind of cheer each other on in your application processes and remind each other of deadlines that you might forget because um, it can be overwhelming and complicated applying to a bunch of different places. So yeah, that's my advice. Um, I wanted to say, so like for me, I feel like it would have been helpful to hear like struggling is normal things being challenging is normal and i feel like even if things seem impossible because sometimes they will the way you deal with that is super important and i feel like that's just something that at least i wish i had focused on a little bit more my piece of advice is going to be very similar to anna um i think a lot of people, especially in CC, their end goal is always to get into a good school, which is great. But I think too many times they put their value in getting into a certain school. And I think that can be really detrimental. And that's one mistake I made the first time that I transferred. Um, I had like a dream school that I really wanted to get into and it didn't work out for me. And it was not Stanford. Um, so I think some like just take your failures as just a sign of redirection. I know that's so cliche, but genuinely that's like the way it, it worked out for me. Um, also, if you really care about the work that you're doing and are doing your best, regardless of where you end up, you're going to be proud of the effort that you made in community college. And at the end of the, the day, you can, you know, sleep at night knowing that you did your best. And that's what really matters. Um, so I think at the end of my second cycle, I think I was just proud of the work that I did and the challenges that I overcome that it didn't matter if I went to Stanford or I went to a different school. Um, I was just proud of the journey that it took. But again, it really helps to have like a support system with you, um, people who are going to advocate for you and be there along the way. Um, so they were great. Like my family and my friends were great motivators for me. Oh, I did want to add on to what Jessica had said um, in terms of the support system. Your uh, professors are a great way to cultivate that, and it can be extremely helpful. It's something that really helped me a lot as well. Um, we have another question. Um, how do you deal with uh, naysay naysayers? I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, or people who discouraged you to apply to Stanford? Ignore them. <laughs> my, when I went to go get one of my uh, my professors to sign off on my current courses, um, he actually chuckled. He said, Stanford, huh? And, and actually laughed. <laughs> and that was completely demoralizing for me at the time. But, you know, being here now, I, I realized how completely insignificant that was. It didn't, it didn't matter. And it, if, even if I had gotten a rejection, a rejection, which you know, I do have a, a small stack of <laughs> from other universities. It it's it didn't affect anything. They didn't change the way that I was applying. They didn't change the way I was being evaluated. Um, they filled out the forms that I needed and scoffed at what I was doing, but it was completely irrelevant. It's it's upsetting and discouraging, I know, <laughs> uh, but it doesn't change the what you're doing or the impact that it'll have on your life when you get where you're headed. I think that's a great answer. And I wanna add that it, there's nothing wrong with keeping your goals a little bit precious if you feel like the people in your life are not going to be supportive or certain people in your life aren't gonna be supportive. You don't have to tell anyone you're applying to Stanford. You can just apply. And then if you get in, you can be like, oh, by the way. Um, but you know, just keep your nose to the grindstone and don't worry about what anyone's thinking. And if telling people about your aspirations is going to make you feel bad or get in your way. Just don't. 
Yeah, I wanted to add on to that. You're not obligated to let anyone know what you're doing. But um, same thing with Kendon, actually, when I was asking for my high school transcripts, when I was just talking to anyone about what I'm going to be doing who wasn't necessarily close to me, they were like, they, they laughed, like they, they scoffed. They were just kind of like, really? Like Stanford? And it, yeah, just I, I just kind of laughed flat back. It's not, um, I don't know. I wouldn't think too much of it, of naysayers, that is. I think I had like a similar fear the first time that I transferred. That's why I didn't apply to Stanford at all, because I was just too embarrassed to ask my professors uh, about like forgetting to get a, like a letter of a recommendation to imply that I was applying here. Um, but I would just say like, ultimately people are just going to say what they think and you shouldn't let other people's insecurity about themselves project, like you shouldn't let them project it onto you. And ultimately, if you decide not to apply to Stanford, um, that's going to be a decision that affects your life and they're going to have no repercuss repercussions for doing so. So um, I highly encourage you to do this for yourself. And, um, you know, I think that's the most important thing. I wish I would have done that sooner. We have another question. Um, any suggestion for those who are easily draining when around groups of people when college success depends on performance while in class? I will say um, as transfers, because this um, school is so small and everybody has known each other for a few years, sometimes like we have to go out of our way to like introduce ourselves and make friends and stuff. And so if you do get drained in groups, like don't worry about it. Like it's going to be fine because if you're not interested in like, um, I guess like I like have what I'm trying to say in my brain, but I can't think of it. Um, like if you are someone who wants to like keep more to yourself in class and like focus and not um, like engage with groups and stuff, like that's okay because like transfers that don't really know that many people here. I don't know if someone can give a better answer than that. I, what I'm trying to say is that most people who are transfers have to go out of our way to participate in the groups. And so if you, um, yeah, anyways, someone can answer that in a more clear way. Yeah, I, I think uh, what, what you're trying to say is pretty right on point, especially if you're if you're a non-traditional transfer student, if you have kids. Um, as a transfer, you're already kind of in a, in a niche group, as was mentioned. Um, if you're a non-traditional transfer, you're a niche of the niche. And if you have kids, then it just keeps going. And it's really hard. It's really easy to end up being so outside of everything that um that you don't feel like you're connected to the to the group or the process or um the, the other students but um i think uh i think trying to get yourself involved in things is harder than actually being involved it's the start that's the most difficult actually putting yourself out there and trying to um trying to become part of you know, whatever it is that you're interested in is is harder than actually making the time to do it. But if you're somebody that's exhausted about doing that, then <laughs> it's fairly easy because you don't have to put yourself out there. Right. If people are studying and, and keeping their keeping their nose to the grindstone, as Anna said. So um, you find a good spot in the library. No one's going to bug you. It doesn't matter. Camden, you said that so eloquently. You put my my brain thoughts into like Beautiful words, thank you. <laughs> I guess I'll also add that um, like for a lot of students, if you like whoever asked this question, if you feel like you're very introverted, if you wanna be a hermit, it's not that hard here to be a hermit. Like there are, this quarter, like most of my lectures are recorded and one of my classes is oversubscribed because it's with a very popular instructor. So the room that we have the class in is actually a quarter the size of the class enrollment. So we're like encouraged to watch from home if we want to. Um, so like there are there are times where I basically just like don't go anywhere because <laughs> I just want to get my work done and hang out and drink tea. Um, so if you if you are someone who like 
gets really burnt out um, or tired around people sometimes, or you just need to like hunker down, like it's it's not that hard to do that here. <laughs> if you want to be reclusive, you can. Also really quickly, I think it's just good to know that you, this is like how you feel and this is what feels best for you. So then you can communicate your boundaries to other people and they can best support you. So for instance, if you're not a confident public speaker and you don't like speaking up in group discussions, TAs or professors are really receptive um, just as long as like you know that this is not the right thing for you and you can communicate with your professor and work with them one on one. Um, we have another question. So if you could do something different in your journey, what would you what would it be and why? What was that? Can you ask that one more time? Yeah, sorry. Um, if you could do something different in your journey, uh, what would it be and why? I, I don't think I would, I don't think I would do anything different. I, the, the culmination of everything that I am is from my experience. So, um, to change any piece of that would change who I am and how I identify today. I don't, I don't think I would want that. Yeah, I really agree with Ken, what Cannon said. It, I wish wouldn't be who I am without anything that had happened or anything that I did. I honestly couldn't say that I would want to change anything. Any mistakes I had made, I'd still want to have made them so I could learn from them. Any of the difficult things I had dealt with, I'd still want to deal with them just because it's made me into the person I am today. I think I would have, um, like echoing what everyone said, I wouldn't have changed a lot, but I think one thing I would have done was taken better care of my mental health. I think this is a very stressful process. And especially after you finish your application, that period of waiting is strenuous. Um, so take care of your mental health, prioritize that. If it means get, getting off of like Reddit or College Confidential, then do it, you know. Um, it's not really worth your mental health and you'll get the decision in the future, like at a certain point. So don't stress out too much. The other thing is that I would just add is reading blogs and college confidential and all this different stuff. Those are just, I call them keyboard warriors that basically sit there and sprout out things. I wasn't going to say the other word. Um, and they don't know what they're talking about. And they come off as expert. Um, I put a quote by uh, Muhammad Ali that talks about impossible. And uh, yeah, and so read it whenever you get a chance. But um, but yeah, don't listen to, I mean, there's, you're going to see a lot of naysayers throughout your life. I mean, uh, and so, you know, you could, you have two choices. Either you listen to them or you ignore them and you know, and be true to yourself, ultimately. Yeah, I think that it's possible for anyone to get into Stanford, um, no matter what classes you've taken, no matter how old you are, no matter what you've been through, no matter the mistakes you've made. Um, I, I see so many, so much diversity in the transfer community, and it's definitely possible, and you can do it, and doesn't hurt to apply. Um, Anything else anybody else would do differently? Okay, and as we're closing out, any last word of advice? Uh, and we'll start with Cassie and go around. Yeah, I would say for the transfer applications, just don't be afraid to be yourself. Um, I think that that will come off a lot more authentically um, than it would otherwise. Like. You are the only version of you on this planet. And I know that sounds super cheesy, but like, um, just be yourself, talk about what's important to you and what you're passionate about, because ultimately like you're interesting, you're excellent and you belong here. And so just believe in yourself.
Uh, Jessica? Oh, no, I just wanted to add if anybody wants to reach out, I'd be happy to send my email in the chat. Um, and we can email, chat, phone call, anything. I'm happy to like support. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I I still often um, have uh, phone calls or uh, email discussions with uh, potential transfers, people that are um, considering transferring or working on applications. Uh, I have helped people with their uh, their essays and stuff before, and it's something I'm happy to do. It's something I enjoy doing, so um, I'm happy to do the same as well. Yeah, same Thank here. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, feel free to email me as well. Um, I think Yobin had shared my email in the chat. Yeah, I put mine in as well. Thank you guys for sharing your, your email. Well, I don't think uh, if I've, if you guys have anything, you know, I this is a, my favorite one. If anybody has any other last questions, uh, go ahead and say it or forever hope. Uh, but we we don't want to keep them longer um, longer than they have to be here. And thank you again um, for your time and uh, making yourself available to us and um, answering all of our questions. Thank have you. A, thank you. Have, have a great Saturday um, studying. Yeah. Thank you. Enjoy thank your you. day. Good luck, everyone. Thank Good you. Luck,